Hi. Uh, so thank you so much for organizing um, to the organizers, um, organizing this wonderful workshop and inviting me to speak. Um, and I really wish I could have attended in person, but uh, um, I hopefully in the future, I'll get a chance to visit the Institute. Okay. Um, so to start out with some broad motivation, okay, um, when we consider the confluence of, of quantum information and um, quantum gravity in the context of ADS-CFT, um, I think, um, well, and the fact that uh, we've learned that gravity essentially amounts to uh, you know, some representation of the information content of a, of a quantum theory, I think an important and useful question that um, could guide us is as follows. Okay, so uh, we could ask this question, um, what is the operational relationship uh, between space-time and corresponding quantum degrees of freedom? Um, in gravity viewed as an effective theory. Okay. So in other words, uh, from the low energy point of view. Okay. Um, so um, to ask this more concretely, right? Suppose if, um, suppose we had some realization or simulation of um, the SYK model in the lab so we have some many body system, okay. Um, strongly interacting many body system. Um, we could ask, uh, okay, in some kind of box, we could ask uh, where exactly is the gravity dual to this, uh, gravity dual to this uh, many body system, okay. So we know that there is some dual, but we could ask where, where that dual is. So question, where is the space-time? Where does it exist? Where is the space-time um, dual to this, um, to this model? And we could also ask, um, what is the significance of the volume measure at a point of the space-time, okay, of the emergent space-time? What is significance of um, a volume measure? <clears throat> at a point of space-time from the point of view of the effective quantum theory describing the, the microscopic uh, model in this, in this case, the SYK. So what is the significance of the volume measure at a point of space-time? And I think these questions are um, still have not been answered, um, but uh, you know, in recent years, there's been a lot of activity um, in zero plus one dimensional models um, represented by the SYK model. So you might hope that we could have some concrete answers to these questions in, in the setting of um, SYK slash JT gravity. And then maybe we can try to build a, build our um, some more general answers um, starting from there. So um, let me just um, go to this setting of um, SYKJT, JT, SYK slash JT duality, and try to answer the above questions. Um, so this will be a very brief uh, um, review, if you like, to set up our discussion. So in um, in the SYK model, how do we how can we answer the two questions above? Well, we have the Green's function of of the fermion. <clears throat> Uh, J, where the chi uh, are Majorana fermions. And um, there are low energy modes that you can derive from the path integral of this uh, microscopic model, which are reparameterizations of, 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 of the time, of the time argument, right? So the, um, effectively what you find is that the two point function, um, which, because we have these low, um, these reparameterization modes, which you can think of as uh, 
some function of the time, okay? Um, these are the emergent modes of the theory, so we have to integrate over them in the path integral with some action describing the modes, and this is um, widely known as, as the short scene action. And then we have to integrate over the reparameterized form of the Green's function. Um, but if we look at the specific form of this um, two-point function, we actually find that it is um, equivalent to the two-point function of a uh, free field on ADS2 um, at, at uh, certain space-time points, right? And the space and where you are in the in the in the um, ADS2, the positions are specified by by this reparameterization function. So phi of tau i would be the time coordinate going around um, Euclidean ADS2, and then you would have phi prime of tau i, which would be the derivative, and this derivative would um, represent where you are in the radial direction. So phi prime actually acts as the radial coordinate um, in two, on two-dimensional ADS2. And um, so as a result, you can write this uh, path integral in the boundary quantum theory as an integral over bulk points, x1 and x2. And x1 and x2 are all um, you know, possible, possible uh, points where the bulk fermion can be. And we integrate over all positions. And then we have an integral over um, this degree of freedom, which I'll describe. Okay, so basically the degree of freedom that's being integrated over is a, um, describes, describes the position of a, of a, of a particle. So let me um, draw a better picture. So we can think of this um, new bulk expression for the two-point function as um, in this way. We have, um, some positions, two positions in the bulk. And there's a mode, there's a particle or a mode in the in the bulk that um, that can go from x tau one to x tau two, and there's an action for that particle. Um, and then we integrate over the two-point function of some scalar fields. Um, let's see. Okay, now this is a bulk bulk fermion field. Okay, so these uh, bulk fermion fields are at pos some positions in the bulk. So ADS2. Okay. Um, so the point, the point I, I want to emphasize here is that from an operational perspective, right? We were interested in um, trying to interpret what the bulk space time and the volume measure at a point of space time is from an operational point of view at low energies. And it seems like the answer to um, those questions, at least in, in the setting of the SYK model, is that from an operational perspective, okay, um, there exists a quantum observable, which is this X. Okay, so X, the position of this uh, particle degree of freedom in the bulk, this is the quantum observable um, that's relevant at low energies. So quantum observable, um, um, in low energy theory of microscopic SYK. And the bulk space time, the so called emergent um, bulk space time, exists as the target space of this observable. So, operationally speaking, Okay, the emergent space time is maybe not so mysterious. We can just think of it as the target space of, um, of this low energy observable, target space of X. Okay. Um, are there any questions at this point? So when we ask the question, where is the emergent space time? We can give an answer. It is the target space of a certain low energy observable in the theory. So that makes it operationally concrete. And then um, to answer the second part of, of um, 
of, of the question, what is the significance of the volume measure at a point of space-time? Um, uh, I mean, this, this is a slightly more non-trivial uh, question. Um, so we can go to the dual gravitational theory Right. Um, so far, we've uh, we started from the SYK model and said that the two point function can be written as a as a path integral over two point functions in the bulk, and there's some degree of freedom um, um, uh, captured by an observable which can take values in a bulk space time. Now, um, how what significance can we associate to the volume measure? Um, at a point of, of that target space. So to answer this question, let's go to the dual um, gravitational theory. Um, dual gravitational theory, J D gravity. Um, so when we write down the action for J T gravity, we have uh, one over four pi. Okay, and this uh, scalar field, this is um, the dilaton field, which makes the gravitational action non-trivial. Um, this is the analog of um, area, co-dimension to areas in higher dimensions. So this is the analog of um, area in higher dimensions. So when we think of the effective volume measure at a point of ADS2, it's actually the effective um, volume measure at a point of ADS2 <clears throat> is actually um, the product of the ADS2 measure, effective volume measure at a point X. Um, it's actually the product of the um, ADS2 measure, which is fixed. So in this um, action, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, um, in this action, um, you see that the dilaton appears as a Lagrange multiplier so that um, the curvature R is fixed to be, if we um, put in a negative cosmological constant, lambda equals minus one, then we have R plus two equals zero as an exact condition. So um, meaning the two-dimensional space-time is fixed to be have constant fixed to have constant negative curvature. Um, so locally it's completely fixed. And so the effective volume measure at a point X could be written as the product of the two-dimensional ADS2 measure, which is non-fluctuating, okay, um, which is non-fluctuating times the dilaton, times the dilaton field. And um, so the point is that um, the equation of motion for the dilaton, so if you vary the action with respect to the dilaton, you'll get that the space-time is locally fixed. And if you vary with respect to the metric, then you'll get um, a non-trivial equation of motion solving for the dilaton. So whereas in higher dimensions, if you vary with respect to the metric, um, you'll get Einstein's equations for the metric. Here, if you vary with respect to the metric, you get some equation of motion for the dilaton. And we can interpret the product of the two-dimensional measure and the dilaton as the effective volume measure at a point. And so we would like to ask the question, um, you know, from the perspective of this uh, quantum observable X, this um, Oh, I erased it again. Sorry. From the from the perspective of this quantum observable X, um, what is the significance of of the stiliton? Okay, of the stiliton field, which is at this point, it's just a, um, it's just some function um, on the target space that solves some equation of motion. Okay. Um, so the the um, it's a non-trivial question, and the solution that we proposed um, in my previous work. So let me. Um, 
was that this volume measure that I've written here is actually the probability measure, um, this dv uh, is a probability measure constrained by um, the quantum dynamics of x of t. Constrained by quantum dynamics of x of t. Okay, so notice that this um, observable x is an observable um, in the low energy theory of SYK. In particular, it evolves in time with respect to the Hamiltonian, um, low energy Hamiltonian in the SYK model. So this, this is time in the boundary um, quantum, mecha quantum mechanical system. So this is time in boundary QM. Um, and um, when we say quantum, um, essentially the the non-trivial content of the statement lies in defining defining the quantum dynamics that constrains the measure. Okay, so how do we how do we characterize the quantum dynamics? Well, um, so the proposal was to use a set of dynamical correlators, okay, which um, we call joint quantum distributions. Um, taking the form as follows. So we can have a distribution for this observable, observable uh, x at time t1, which takes this form. So if you look at the form of this um, uh, If you look at the form of this uh, distribution, it's actually a projector, okay, a projector to the point, uh, bulk point x1 at boundary time t1. It's the expectation value of that projector. So it's um, it's a probability. It's a probability, uh, uh, it's a probability distribution. Um, I, I don't think I want to call it a distribution. It's um, well, it's a probability that actually does integrate to one, because if you integrate over the target space, then this actually gives you one. Um, so that's the that's the distribution at a single time. Um, but we can also think about the generalization of such a distribution to multiple times. So we can write Q T2 T1 X2 X1. And this would be the expectation value of a product of two different projectors at two different times. So we have the same um, projector as before. Projector onto bulk point x1 at time, boundary time t1, multiplying projector onto bulk point x2 at time t2. And um, because the product of projectors is not a projector unless they commute, um, this is not an actual probability distribution in the sense that, yes, it will integrate to one when we integrate over uh, when we integrate over um, x one and x two, it will integrate to one, but it's not guaranteed to be positive. right? We would want a um, probability distribution to be positive, but, in general, this, this quantity, QT2T1, this uh, joint quantum distribution, as I've labeled it, will be complex. So the idea is to think of these um, correlators in the quantum theory as quantum generalizations of joint probability distributions. And when you identify them in, in that way, then you can derive a constraint on coming from these joint quantum distributions on an arbitrary probability measure that's defined in the target space of X. And I guess the main check of this uh, proposal was that if we used 
if we used these uh, joint quantum distributions computed from the low energy theory of SYK and derived a, and der um, when we derive a constraint on a probability measure um, in the target space coming from these joint quantum distributions, that constraint actually coincides with the gravitational equations of motion for the dilaton coming from the um, two-dimensional JT action. So that was the that was the main result um, in these two papers. And um, are there any questions at this point? Um, uh, I have a question. Yes. Yes. Uh, the the qu joint quantum they look very similar to what you look at in the page Wouters mechanism. So <laughs> any uh, connection or similarity there besides uh, the formal similarity. Sorry, what, 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 what do they look similar to? Uh, in the page Wouters mechanism, if you have like, uh, if you look at the wheeler debit equation and you add an observer and look at like relative, it's in quantum reference frames, people look at similar things basically. Um, I was just wondering whether that's, uh, you, you know about yeah, that. Yeah, I actually haven't looked at uh, the references I think you're referring to. So if you, if you give me the, the references. Yeah, I can, I can send them to you. Okay, it's, okay, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that would be great, yeah. Okay, so, um, so this was, you know, a concrete, a statement that we could check very concretely in, um, in the setting of SYKJT. But of course, we're interested in the more general question of, you know, how can we quantize gravitational theories and how can we identify the appropriate quantum degrees of freedom when we um, go through with such a quantization. So this motivated um, a general, this motivated us to make a general conjecture, um, general conjecture. And we, we could view this as a conjecture about um, holographic quantization. How do we quantize, quantize an arbitrary theory of gravity? Okay. That the volume measure of, so the conjecture would be that the volume measure um, at a point of space time, volume measure at a point of space time can be identified as a probability measure constrained by the dynamics of, of some quantum observable. Okay. Probability measure constrained by dynamics of quantum observable. So um, in this statement, you know, we were thinking of this quantum observable, sorry, uh, as, uh, you know, the quantum degrees of freedom in a bottom-up quantized theory of gravity. So we're not, at this point, at this stage, we're not um, trying to make a connection to um, observables in a microscopic theory, say, that is that is dual or that gives rise to the um, gravity theory. At low energies, we are thinking of this, um, this quantum observable as a... Um, as, as a degree of freedom in bottom-up quantized theory of gravity. Okay. Bottom up. Gravity. And I want to emphasize that um, holography is built in here. Um, so the idea is that, uh, again, going back to um, the SYK JT setup, so what we had was we had some observable that came from the low energy theory, okay, that exists in the low energy effective theory of the SYK model, right? The um, the observable X and um, ADS two, the bulk space time existed as a target space for that observable, and so really there was only a boundary degrees worth of um, freedom, degree of freedom. Um, and it seemed like uh, so. I mean, if we if if we think of generalizing that, if we think of generalizing, you know, what we found there in in this sense that we should interpret the volume measure at a point of space time as the probability measure. The idea is that um, the 
the quantum observable, okay, the quantum observable um, giving rise to constraints on the probability measure, we only need a boundary's worth of um, degrees of freedom. Okay, so in some sense, we, um, you know, the idea that we only have a hol um, boundary's worth of degrees of freedom in, in our quantum theory should be baked into this, um, well, I mean, as part of this conjecture. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, please uh, feel free to interrupt me with questions. Okay, so, right. So the idea is if we can carry this through, um, we should be able to, in some sense, what we would like is a, is a method to quantize a theory of gravity. Maybe, um, it, you know, it, maybe we don't necessarily need to have ADS. We could have other kinds of space times. And if we have a, some systematic method of, you know, computing some observables and the effective gravity theory, and we can interpret them in terms of um, probability, in terms of uh, in terms of the probability associated with some quantum degrees of freedom. This gives us a way of um, understanding or quantizing gravity in general, and I'm calling this um, holographic quantization for now. Um, right. So to give meat to this conjecture, to give um, to flesh out this conjecture, and to verify it, um, what we need are, are a set of observables, right? We, we need, um, we would like to identify a set of observables that we can actually compute um, given, you know, a gravitational action. So we would like to be able to compute them um, in perturbative quantum gravity. Um, and the idea is the goal would be to extract the dynamics of the holographic, um, well, the if you like the dynamics associated with the um, Hamiltonian of the holographic degrees of freedom, the goal would be to extract those dynamics by looking at such observables. Okay, so given given the um, content of this conjecture, which is you know which relates the volume measure to probability, um, a natural set of observables would be as follows. Okay, so a natural set of observables to try to compute. Um, in perturbative quantum gravity would be correlators of volume elements. So holographic circles, correlators of volume elements. Okay. In gravity. So um, schematically, we could write, write such correlators in the following way, dot, 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 where dV um, is the volume measure at a point. Okay. And um, you know, the intuition we have at this stage is that such correlations of volume elements, correlations of volume elements in, um, in code, correlations of volume elements should encode the joint quantum distributions associated with holographic degrees of freedom, joint quantum distributions um, of holographic degrees of freedom. So um, of course, uh, so this is work in progress. Um, so what I'd like to, um, focus uh, in the rest of the talk is, you know, the concrete problem of how to compute these correlators, because uh, there are some non-trivial conceptual problems that we have to address when we try to compute these, um, these correlators of volume elements. Okay, um, so any, any questions at this point? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so first of all, we don't, I'm not talking about normalized probability distributions, of course, right? If you integrate over the volume measure on, on ADS2, you don't get one, it's infinity. So I'm not, I'm not referring to normalized probability distributions. Um, I'm referring to sort of measures with arbitrary normalization. Um, other than that, I don't have like a, 
I don't have a characterization of like uh, a narrow class of <laughs> probability distributions that should be relevant. Um, I think the more relevant question perhaps is not the um, form of the distribution itself, but actually the, I think the more relevant question is perhaps um, how can we characterize the dynamics that give rise, that um, give rise to, that constrain the probability measures. Um, well, I mean, I think it's just a more well-defined question to study the dynamics. So really like um, one motivation for um, coming up with these joint quantum distributions was um, to think about um, what we learned by studying chaos. So when we study chaos, we have um, a dynamical phenomenon, right? Chaos, which is usually defined in classical systems right, like the exponential divergence of trajectories. And we try to translate that to quantum systems. And then we find that uh, we can do that using OTOCs, right? And then um, if you have a quantum system with a large number of degrees of freedom, that's large N. And uh, if you have a semi-classical limit, a well-defined semi-classical limit, then those OTOCs um, sometimes exhibit, uh, you know, this exponential behavior. So that's like, um, uh, and then we can make, we can sort of make contact with the classical notion of, of the exponential divergence of trajectories using, o using dynamical correlators. So, um, and it so happens that, you know, you can compute OTOCs in any kind of quantum system, but if you have a quantum system that has a gravity dual, then um, you see a maximal exponent, Lyapunov exponent in the OTOC. So the idea would be, he, here would also be that um, we can use these joint quantum distributions. And of course, we could calculate such joint quantum distributions in any kind of quantum system. But maybe gravity is a special limit or is, a, is a, an extremal limit of such dynamics. And, uh, you know, I discussed this in my papers. Um, so the, the rough conjecture or intuition at this point is that maybe um, the extremal limit of um, these uh, joint distributions is that they're they they're Markovian, and uh, that's that that characterizes the quantum dynamics that gives rise to gravity. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's the question of like if you're interested in like what's special about gravity, right? I think maybe you're maybe my answer was a was a bit um, far off from what you actually your actual question, but um, yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so maybe it's uh, better to look at the dynamics that give rise to the probability measure than the probability measure itself. Maybe it's a better way to characterize gravity. Okay, so um, uh, okay, so um, we have these correlators volume elements that we would like to compute and um, in perturbative quantum gravity using using a gravitational path integral. Uh, okay, so perturbative. Perturbative quantum gravity using a gravitational path integral. And we run into a, an immediate sort of problem, conceptual problem we need to address, which is that um, we need a diffeomorphism invariant way of specifying a point in the bulk space time, right? So this has uh, been discussed before in the literature. Um, <clears throat> we need a diffeomorphism invariant way. Uh, we need diffeomorphism invariant specification of, uh, of a point of a point in the bulk space time. And only then can we talk meaningfully about the volume measure at a point. Okay. So this is, um, you know, this is a, I think, a widely known, known problem. So, for example, if you have a, if we consider a diffeomorphism phi, if we consider a diffeomorphism phi acting on our space-time manifold, and um, if we consider the contribution to say the two-point function of volume elements at 
points x1 and x2 coming from coming from uh, the gravitational path integral over you know some infinitesimal part of configuration space of the metric configuration space um, they would take the following form so we would evaluate the uh, square root of minus g um, and then it's weighted by this this the gravitational action um, and the point is that if we consider the same contribution but coming from part of the configuration uh, uh, coming from the the metric related by a diffeomorphism to g so i'll, I'll call that uh, phi star g um, the pullback Let's see so if we consider a similar contribution coming from the pullback dv x1 dv x2 uh, so I need a subscript G here. And if I put subscript phi star G here, if you um if you if you consider putting in uh phi star G here, phi star G here, phi star G here, phi star G here, of course the action is invariant, right? The action is invariant. And um putting in phi star G here just gives you the the volume measure at the at the mapped point. Right, so this actually gives you, when you put in phi star g instead of g, you get um, the volume measure at the mapped points, dv at phi of x1 and dv at phi of x, x2, um, evaluated at g. Okay, so the root of the problem is that in the gravitational path integral, we need to factor out by diffeomorphisms. And... Um, the action is invariant under diffeomorphisms, but actually these uh, local fields, for instance, they transform, and they get mapped um, along with the along with a point in this um, under this diffeomorphism. So I I think the best way to capture this is that um, if I draw a picture, right? So if we have some, I'm going to represent like uh, the space-time manifold with this with this. Uh, graph. Okay, so if we have a point on the space-time manifold, okay, and we have a, okay, we, I guess you can think of this patch as like a coordinate patch. Okay, we map, we map the space-time manifold, and this mapping just means that we, we are looking at a different portion of the, of the space-time manifold. Okay, so the diffeomorphism instructs that, um, we are now looking at phi of p instead of p, but of course, you know, there should be some notion, we would like some notion of a point p that that does not move, that is invariant under diffeomorphisms. And from this picture, you can see that maybe, you know, the, the way to go, go about that is to try to define p relative to the geometric features of the space-time manifold, right? You, you, P is defined by the fact that it exists at this point where the manifold looks like this. Okay, if you if you don't define P in that way, then you all you can say about P is that you know it has some coordinate x, but of course you can you can map the coordinates, or alternatively you can map map the manifold, and and that point um, gets transformed. Okay, so right. So we would like an invariant notion. We would like some coordinate um, independent way of specifying a point of the of the space time. Um, so I was um, trying to research um, an answer to this, and of course, I think um, um, I think maybe in the two thousands, people you know people usually discuss in this um, in terms of like having a you know attaching some line to the boundary of your space time and then I'm um, trying to define basically having something like a Wilson line but in the gravitational context but I think it's um I think it's worthwhile to go back to um what Mandelstam did okay so Mandelstam wrote a paper in 1968 and I uh, and I found a follow up paper by Tidal Boy in 1993 they actually try to get to Sort of a mathematically concise description of how we can actually specify a point um, 
that in a way that is invariant under diffeomorphisms. Let me. <clears throat> so Mandelstam. In 1968, oops, I don't think three. And so the main idea that you can find there is that you can specify a point um, as the endpoint of a pa path, okay? And that path can be defined in a manifestly diffeomorphism invariant manner. So let me. So specify a point in space-time as endpoint of a path um, of path P. So um, I'm going to discuss this um, from the active perspective. So think of fixing a coordinate system on the manifold and we can we can of course map the manifold um, under diffeomorphisms but the coordinate system is fixed and so if the path p is defined in a manifestly invariant manner then this point x of p is fixed okay so how do we specify um, a path in a diff invariant manner okay so so the 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 picture would be this that First of all, we need to specify a point on the boundary of space-time where, um, so, and the assumption is that diffeomorphisms um, that we factor out in the gravitational path integral acts trivially on the boundary. So points on the boundary are invariant under diffeomorphism. So we specify some point um, P naught on the boundary. Okay, so ingredients of this um, path are one. Um, the first ingredient would be point on boundary. And the second uh, ingredient would be a frame, a set of frame vectors or a frame at, at this uh, initial point. So EA, you should think of as um, a vector with components and, you know, that you can specify in any coordinate system if you want, but EA, the set of EA is a tetrad or, or, or a frame at, at P naught. So you specify a frame at the initial point on the boundary and then the last ingredient you need is a uh, is a tangent vector along the path um, that you specify um, in the frame basis. So tangent vector along path in frame basis. Um, so the idea is that. We transport the initial frame along. Uh, we we um, parallel transport the initial frame, and as we as we move along the path, we simultaneously solve for the displacement along the path and the parallel transport of the frame. So you can see that um, starting with the, these initial conditions, for, okay, we can solve for the displacement right um, at the initial point. That would be given by the the frame uh, times the tangent vector. So that would give you the uh, displacement. And then you can parallel transport the frame at the initial point um, along that displacement. And then you can repeat the process because you know the tangent vector at the next point and you know the frame at the next point. So simul you can simultaneously solve um, can simultaneously solve for displacement displacement and parallel transport a frame and you can see here that we never used we never relied on on, on um on our coordinate system right so the a is a is an index is a tetrad index, and we we never all of this is basis independent or coordinate independent. Okay, and 
you can see that it makes use of the, the geometry, the metric that you have um, by the parallel transport of the frame. So even if you give the same specification of a path, um, the solution will differ depending on what kind of metric you have. Um, you know, which corresponds to the fact that we've defined a we've defined a point using the geometric features of our of our manifold. Um, so this is a nice way of specifying a point. And once we have this um, path, then, for instance, if we if we try to um, write down the if we try to evaluate a function at a point which is specified to be the endpoint of a path. Okay, because this path is, is an independent object that we can map under diffeomorphisms, basically we have the relation that, you know, f at x of p is equal to the pullback of f, okay, evaluated at the endpoint of the pullback of p. Okay, so let me, let me um, draw this in a picture. So this path is a well-defined object, and we can define the pullback of the path. So the pullback of the path will actually satisfy, I didn't write down um, the equations here, but basically these words simultaneously solve for displacement and parallel transport. These can be translated to two differential equations, which are essentially equations of motion for the path. And um, we can, if we have a path, we can define, oops, sorry. Um, the pullback of the path, um, which satisfies equations of motion with respect to the pullback of the Christoffel symbols of the original metric. So these um, equations of motion, these equations of motion, um, um, they depend on the Christoffel symbol calculated from the metric. And what I'm saying is that this pullback path here by star P will satisfy equations of motion with respect to the pullback of the Christoffel symbol of the original metric. So in some sense, they, yeah, there are paths on, on the pullback geometry. But the important point is that we can independently, independently define the pullback of these paths so at the end of the day, we can effectively um, view f of xp uh, uh, as a gauge invariant object, as a gauge invariant object that can be computed as integrals of gauge dependent objects, gauge invariant object that can be computed As integrals of uh, gauge dependent objects, gauge so very concretely, we can write, for example, a function evaluated at the endpoint of a path as the integral um, as the integral of the function over the entire um, manifold. Let's see function okay it's an integral of the function of the entire manifold integrated against a kernel okay and this kernel you can essentially think of as a delta function that will um, take a point to the point fixed by the path and um, so you can think of you can think of this f of xp as a gauge invariant object in the sense that we have this uh, integral expression involving the just the regular function, um, but the same integral can be written in terms um, using the pullback function. Um, so pullback pullback of the kernel. Okay, so practically, okay, I think it's important. I mean, it's these, I mean, this, I think this um, way of 
this method of specifying a path is interesting in the sense that we get a practical way of computing these objects. Um, so here we have um, the pullback function. And so we use the pullback function and then we all we have to do is also transform this kernel. Okay, and this and this um, transformation, the pullback of this kernel is well defined. I won't go into the details, but basically you can see that uh, you can essentially do a change of variables and you'll get some well-defined expression for the pullback kernel. And so you can imagine, for example, when we try to calculate the expectation value of some scalar field using the gravitational path integral, we may be able to make use of um, this integral formula. Um, okay, so any, any questions at this point? So going back to our um, goal, which was the computation of um, volume correlators in JT gravity. Okay, the computation would proceed as follows. So we have computation of volume correlators. Um, oh, sorry. Computation of volume correlators, and as an example, I'll just try to demonstrate how it would um, proceed in the, in the example of JT gravity. Okay, um, example. Okay, so for example, um, e.g., in JT gravity. Um, so, you know, what we would do is we would start out with um, the action, but we introduce a source, right? Just as we calculate correlators of fields by coupling the field to a source in the action, we would um, add a source term in the gravitational action. Okay, so this J, um, you can see couples to the Dilaton times the times the volume measure um, plus boundary term. Um, so um, how do we proceed? So we would do a, um, we would expand the action. We would expand the action around the classical background. So it's just um, a perturbative calculation. So we expand the action in G, the a metric fluctuation about the background. Um, and of course, the, the dilaton doesn't propagate um, because it, it only appears linearly. Um, so what you would have, okay, so forgetting, for instance, this, um, this complication that we actually have to fix, um, a specify a coordinate with a path, if we were to try to compute an object like dv of x1, dv of x2, correlator, we would draw some Feynman diagrams, right? We would draw some Feynman diagrams that have two sources two insertions of J. So we would have diagrams. And of course, um, we're working in the limit of G Newton is small. Um, and so there's a loop expansion. And uh, to order um, to order G Newton, we only have to take into account diagrams at one loop. So what we would do is, um, let's see, the diagrams that we would draw are look like this. So this would be the tree level contribution. And for example, we would have a contribution that looks like this, okay, one loop. Um, we would also have a diagram that looks like this. And also like this. Okay, the three graviton vertex comes from just expanding the gravitational action, okay. So these are the diagrams that we would draw, and the we incorporate um, we incorporate what we just discussed above. We can incorporate it by using path fixed propagators in these diagrams. So the idea is that we compute these diagrams just as before, but with um, the substitution of of certain propagators where one or both ends of the propagator are fixed by paths. So instead of using the regular gravitational propagator. Um, for example, um, here, oh, sorry, here in this propagator, because one one endpoint is is fixed, and we want to fix it as the endpoint of a path, 
instead of the regular gravitational propagator there, um, we would replace it by a propagator where one endpoint is fixed. Okay. G S P. Okay. And um, I guess the part of this that I haven't really explained in detail is that uh, in order to you know, compute these propagators and so on, we need to actually solve for this um, kernel, this W perturbatively, around, again, uh, um, with respect to the classical background. But assuming that um, we've done that, we can make the substitution and we have a systematic way of computing. Um, what we've done is we've come up with a way of systematically computing the um, correlators of volume elements. Uh, so gauge invariant correlators of volume elements and perturbative quantum gravity. So let me um, end with some, um, some questions that you know, we would like to answer with this kind of formalism and also maybe um, important remaining conceptual questions. So one, okay, so I guess one immediate, okay, to do is uh, find find out. Um, so we could do this calculation in the using the bulk action of JT gravity, and then find out how the dynamics, find out how dynamics of uh, boundary observable X uh, can be read off can be read off these volume correlators. So remember, um, we sort of uh, the reason that we started. Um, the reason that we wanted to calculate these correlators is because we suspected that the that the correlations of volume elements encode the joint quantum distributions, encode the joint quantum distributions of the boundary observable. So we would like to find a way to read off read off that um, read off that dynamics of, of the holographic degree of freedom from these volume correlators. So find out how dynamics of boundary observable X can be read off. Be right off, and I think a second interesting um, question is to try to figure out the intrinsic meaning. Okay, so the intrinsic meaning of these uh, of these volume correlators, of, for example, for example, dV of x p one, dV of x p two. Remember now, these are anchored by paths um, starting from the boundary, so it seems like they may have. They may well have some interpretation, some intrinsic significance in the microscopic quantum theory. Okay, in the microscopic uh, quantum theory of the boundary. So I'm thinking of something like uh, the Ryu-Takenagi formula, where you have some diffeomorphism invariant geometric quantity, like the area of a co-dimension two surface that's anchored. That's anchored on some boundary co-dimension two surface, and here we have again a diffeomorphism invariant quantity given, you know, given, given in, um, by paths, and maybe we can um, associate, um, we can find the significance of such volume correlators from the point of view of the microscopic quantum theory. Okay, so intrinsic meaning of dV in the microscopic quantum theory of that. Um, yeah, so. Um, <laughs> I've come to the end of my talk and be happy to open it up to questions. <laughs> okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I think, I mean, I mean, that's, you know, that's certainly an interesting thing to think about. Um, definitely, a lot of this was motivated by trying to go beyond um, entanglement. So let me, um, let me try to say something about that. Um, so entanglement, entanglement is, is, is a quantity that can be defined 
at, at an instant of time on the boundary, right? So we can, we can think of the entanglement entropy of some region at some fixed time t. And so it seems to be when we, when, 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 when we try to reconstruct the bulk, we should actually know something about the dynamics of the boundary theory as well on top of entanglement. And I think, I mean, that's, that's one of the main motivations that I had in trying to characterize the dynamics of, of the boundary theory in, in some way, um, using, these, uh, using these joint quantum distributions. So for example, I'm, I think one way um, to say this more concretely is suppose, of course, I think many people, I think people may be familiar with, with the work by, um, I think uh, Mark Van Ramsdonk and I think maybe Myers and others. So it's at some point they wanted to use um, the Ryu-Takenagi formula to derive Einstein's equations in the bulk, right? And that's, that's very well-known work. Um, so in that context, they succeeded in doing it, but only in a very um, in, but only in a situation with a lot of symmetry. So they they needed a um, the vacuum. They needed to start in the vacuum of a CFT, and they could only derive Einstein's equations perturbatively. Um, and that essentially has to do with the fact that, you know, with the fact that I just referred to, which is that. The Ryu-Takenagi formula, the entanglement entropy, is a quantity that um, doesn't know about the dynamics of the spacetime. So, in some sense, in order to derive the bulk dynamics from from Ryu-Takenagi, you, you need you need a lot of symmetry. You can't derive it in the most general case. So now, if you compare that with um, the situation or the calculation in, in um, JT gravity that I described in the beginning of the talk, which is that we start out with these um, correlators, these dynamical correlators, which know about the Hamiltonian, these joint quantum distributions, and then we, and then we derive the full Einstein's equations in the bulk. It's a different way of deriving um, Einstein's equations, which manifestly, I think, um, um, it contains more in basically it knows about the dynamics, whereas Ryu Takenagi does not know about the dynamics. So I think it. Yeah, and a lot of this was actually motivated by trying to go beyond Ryu Takenagi. And but the the you know the main idea that we took away from Ryu Takenagi, which is that in, information is important, you know, which is the 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 gravitational theory um, really manifests the information content of the quantum theory. That that idea is still um, you know it, it sort of continues here because we're trying to interpret a geometric quantity, which is the volume measure. Uh, we're trying to interpret that as a probability from the quantum point of view. So that's an intrinsically information theoretic interpretation of, of the volume measure of space time. Yeah, so I, yeah. Um, but yeah, in terms of like um, concrete ways, concrete connections, um, I think once we get a handle on the second question, then we may one may be able to make more progress. Like for example, once, once we um, anchor ourselves on the boundary, then I think we can begin to, to, to discuss um, um, in a fashion that's like, well, yeah, I mean, um, so once we know the intrinsic meaning of these volume correlators where these points are specified by these paths um, anchored at points, then for example, you could imagine like um, defining a point using a path starting from the left boundary, right? When we, when we talk about entanglement, we have you know, in the context of JT gravity, for instance, we we like to talk about two copies of the SYK, right? Um, and entanglement is, uh, yeah, it's manifest when you have two copies of the SYK, and and the um, the appearance of a horizon is is connected to the entanglement. And so here, I think you could try to explore the connection to that type of physics by anchoring these paths. One path you could anchor from the left. One path you could anchor from the right. And then you start to begin exploring the, yeah, the the relations between the two copies. But anyways, that's just a vague comment. Okay, at this point, yeah.
Yeah. Um, so, I mean, this computation, for, I mean, what we did, what we actually did here was we started out with the gravitational theory, right? We started out with a gravitational theory and we did a computation in, in perturbative quantum gravity. Um, so if you want to try to reconstruct this um, calculation in the gravity theory from the boundary point of view, what you would actually need to know is like an expression. So these are the boundary expressions, these joint quantum distributions. So number one, okay, we would have to, we first have to find out how to read off these joint quantum distributions from the correlators of volume elements. And then conceptually, the question would be, how do we construct these, uh, um, let's see, these projectors, sorry. So these are projectors. So um, I've written it in this form, but more generally, you could just think of a projector that projects onto some point um, of the target space, right? So if you have a quantum theory, you can certainly imagine computing trace of row times a projector evolved to some time T1, right? That That's just something you, that you can, that is well-defined in the quantum theory. But I guess the um, idea would be that these joint quantum distributions do not constrain a probability measure in the way that they do in a in a in a holographic theory. I guess that would be the the idea, and so it sort of connects to um, my answer to is it is it Alejandro at the end? I I can't see the. Anyways, yeah. So it, I I discussed. Um, remember, I discussed characterizing characterizing the dynamics of, of the quantum theory in order um, to figure out whether it's secretly a gravitational theory or not. So in the case of chaos, it's maximal chaos. And, um, you know, conjecture here is that maybe if these joint quantum distributions um, exhibit the Markovian property, um, then maybe that specifies it has a, it has a gravi gravity to one. Yeah, so to go back to your question, I guess, you could try computing these joint quantum distributions in whatever quantum theory you have, but you will find that they um, do not have this Markovian property. Or I mean, <laughs> I mean, all of this, a lot of this needs to be worked out. But um, the the intuition that we have right now is that um, you know you could we could try to characterize whether the joint quantum distributions have the Markovian property or not. If they do then it's reasonable to write down this constraint equation. I, I didn't explain this, but this the fact that these joint quantum distributions constrain a probability measure, that has a lot to do with um, whether they have the Markovian property or not. Yeah, so you could try computing these joint quantum distributions and um, if they have the Markovian property, uh, then the idea is that you could connect it to a gravitational theory and the the concrete relationship between these joint quantum distributions and the correlators of volume elements in the gravitational theory that that's um, still part of um, you know work in progress. Yeah.